worship you. Oh, we sing holy, holy, holy. 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 Hallelujah. Jesus, we join with the elders today. We say that you are holy. You are holy. You are holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Yes, Jesus. So holy. Oh, 
you Lord praise you Jesus praise you. Jesus when we sing that that we want you to be our lifelong passion that's really a declaration of faith because our minds don't comprehend the fullness of what that means for you to be our lifelong passion but yet we know it's the right thing we know it's a good thing and we know it's what you want so we declare it Jesus be our lifelong passion I say you are my lifelong passion. I declare that over me. I say that's what I want. I say that's what I hunger for. That you are my lifelong passion. And there is no other. Father, tonight, here in this place and wherever people are watching, may your passion for us be so strong that we sense it and we realize that you do love us no matter how unlovable we may feel you love us with an eternal passion and I thank you for that so tonight Father once again your will be done here and wherever people are watching we praise you and thank you for it now in Jesus name Amen Amen praise God well why don't you passionately shake some hands? Good evening, good evening, and again I say good evening. You guys are looking great. You know, the Bible talks about calling things that aren't as though they were. <laughs> but that's not what I'm doing, okay? <laughs> Well, today is um, April 10th. Conference starts in 18 days. Glory to God. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, huh? And um, just a reminder that, you know, Easter is a week and a half away. So we will not be having Sunday night service on Easter Sunday. You know, we kinda, you, you folks are kind of used to that anyway, but um, I do want to make the announcement especially for the people that are watching because, you know, we have new viewers and uh, just want to keep them up to date as well. But we will not be having service 
on Easter Sunday night. Now, we will be having service, regular service, Easter Sunday morning, and we'll be having communion at that time. Uh, how many of you remember growing up and churches having sunrise service? On, uh, glory to God. I tell you what, I couldn't stand those. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you... When you're a kid, it's bad enough you have to get up and go to church every Sunday morning, right? I mean, you know how it is, kids, right? But then to have to get up extra early for a sunrise service, it's like, what's the point? I mean, you know, I know he rose from the dead, okay? You know, just let me sleep and get up, eat my fruity pebbles, and then I'll be at church. <laughs> now, we didn't have those when I was a kid. We ate real cereal, you know, Cheerios, bless the Lord. So anyway... Um, we will not be having a sunrise service. <laughs> on the, yes, it, thank you. Oh, glory to God. Now that right there, that's the most positive reaction I've had in a long, long time. <laughs> oh, thank you, Brother Martin. Glory. Looking forward, you know, to the conference. And, and again, just you guys be sensitive to the Lord. We want to be good hosts. We want to be loving hosts. Praise the Lord. Tonight, what I'm going to do is share with you one of the reasons that many Christians aren't making progress in the Lord. And for some, this could be kind of a sensitive issue, but not for all. In fact, what I'm going to be sharing with you here tonight, this process sometimes just happens without a whole lot of effort. But sometimes you've got to put forth some effort and deal with it. Now, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 15. So please turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm giving you a moment there to find it because I want you to see it. I want you to read it with me. It's not a long verse, but it is a very important verse. 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, verse 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Now this sounds actually, you know, you read it and you think, okay, you know, evil communications. Ooh, that sounds pretty bad. But then the whole thing of good manners, it's like, well, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to, you know, put my elbows on the table when I eat. And uh, I'll hold the door for ladies. I, I will maintain my good manners. Well, that's not what this is talking about. It's far uh, more serious than that. So what I'm going to do is read this verse to you and throw in some of the uh, Greek definitions of the words in this verse. So, and I'm not going to give the Greek words. I'm just going to read the what you might call the Martin Amplified version, for lack of a better term. Do not allow yourself to believe anything else. Evil, bad, worthless, morally corrupt, communications, talk, conversations, corrupt, waste, bring to a worse state, spoil, good, profitable, useful, Toward others, gentle manners, habits, customs, morals, ethics, and character. In other words, this isn't talking so much about what you do, but it's also talking about what you allow to be done in your presence. And herein is a major problem in the body of Christ. Because he says right here, do not be deceived. Or, you know, be not deceived. And that literally means do not allow yourself to believe anything but this. Or do not allow yourself to believe this is not right. When you are in the presence of evil, bad, worthless, morally corrupt, communications, talk, conversations, and, that, and you stay in that presence. I mean, that is what you subject yourself to. 
it will corrupt, waste, bring to a worse state, and spoil your good, profitable, useful toward others, gentle manners, habits, customs, morals, ethics, and character. Now, another way to say this is, it's a variation on the theme of the sower sows the word. When Jesus was talking about the sower sows the word, he was focusing on the word of God. But the opposite is just as true. If you hang around people of, as he says here, evil communications, if you ha hang around people like that, and they're the folks that are your, call it your circle of friends, they are going to drag you down. Now, some people would say, oh, no, Brother Martin, that doesn't happen. That, you know, that, no, d don't, don't argue with me about this now, all right? I mean, because this is the word of God. And he starts right out by saying, be not deceived. In other words, the potential for you to not believe this is very real. But this is God saying, you had better watch out who you hang around with. You better watch out who your friends are. And if they are not friends that you need, that they don't need to be your friends. Now, see, there's a difference between acknowledging somebody and making or, or, or maintaining, if you will, a strong friendship relationship. There's a huge, huge difference in that. And some Christians just don't understand it. <clears throat> See, there's a song, and uh, part one of the verses says, Jesus, friend of sinners. All right? And then people want to talk about, well, when Jesus was on the earth, you know, he, he went to where the sinners were. Hey, guess what? He didn't have a choice. <laughs> Everybody was lost, all right? It, it, think of it this way. Jesus faced the potential to be the loneliest person in history because he had nobody compatible with him. That was it. There was nobody the only person that he had was God, the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's it. There was no other human being that he could carry on a conversation with. You'll understand more about this in just a few minutes. And God is saying, look, <laughs> don't be deceived here. Because if you hang around the wrong people, they are going to influence you. And just the opposite is true in the minds of so many Christians. It's like, well, yeah, but I want to be a witness to them. <clears throat> well, you can be a witness to them. But what's the word say here? Yeah, I, I know. I know what the word says. But, but what? But you don't understand, Brother Martin. I'm strong enough, and, and I will not cave in. Okay, the very fact you're saying that proves to me you're not strong enough. Because it says right here, be not deceived. And you saying that proves to me you are deceived. You cannot hang around the wrong crowd. You can't do it. Well, what if the wrong crowd is my family? Well, hey, a lot of Christians can bear witness with that one. You know, what's that saying? You can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family? Well, you know what? Didn't Jesus say something about and I'm paraphrasing, how that the gospel is going to bring division even in families. I can tell you how to solve the, yeah, but what if the people are my family? You just start living like Jesus in the house. And the day's going to come, they're not going to take it. I mean, they'll be on you like stink on a skunk. They'll read you the riot act. Who do you think you are? More holy than me. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? They'll stop fellowshipping with you. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, they show they come home drunk, and you just say, "Well, you know, you, you shouldn't be drinking like that." Who are you to judge me? Like, well, I'm not. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. That's the Bible. Who you think you know? <laughs> Pretty soon, they're going to wish you would move out. They might even give you money to move out. Now, I know I'm being a little silly on that one, but. 
The Word of God is the Word of God. And I'll tell you another thing. <laughs> In a husband wife relationship, when one is taking that stand for Jesus Christ and not backing down, do not be surprised if the unsaved or the compromising spouse comes to the point of wanting a divorce. That's the power of God's life in an individual. That's the power of holiness. Because God does not approve of divorce. But when it comes down to compromise to stay married or take a stand and be told we're getting a divorce, take your stand. And I already know you've got Christians around. They give me the what for just because I said that. But I'm asking you, what's it say? Be not deceived. Be not deceived. Because the moment you start thinking that this stuff doesn't matter, you're deceived. The problem, or part of the problem, is that you hear so much, we have to meet the world where they are. You know, we have to be what the world desires. If we're, if we're going to reach them, we've got to get out there where they are. What does that mean? I am out there where they are. When I go to the grocery store, guess what? I'm where they are. When I go to the gas station, guess what? I'm where they are. When I go to the restaurant, guess what? I'm where they are. What more do you want? What, what exactly do you mean by that? Because... In this building, we have a safe haven. I mean, really, we do. This is not a hangout for heathens. Now, some churches. <laughs> but yeah, you like that? <laughs> you can quote me. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah, this is not a hangout for heathens. But once we leave this building, you and I both know it's a heathen world. You know, what was that? Um, oh, what's her name? You know, Fred Sanford's, you know, you know, Fred, you heathen. Whap, whap, she'd hit him with her purse. You know. Yeah, Aunt Esther, that was it, yeah. Okay, well, it, it's out there. You don't, ha you don't have to go far. They're out there. So I really don't understand what Christians mean by, well, you have to go out where the world is. I do every day, the days I go out. <laughs> so this says, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Now, some people, I'm telling you right now, some people are going to hear with you know, half of one ear, what I'm sharing tonight, and they're going to say, well, Pastor Martin says we're supposed to be rude to people. I'm not saying that. Just at least listen with 100% of both ears and, and hang loose here till the message is over. He says, don't allow yourself to believe anything else. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Now, obviously, we know if we're doing it ourselves, that's going to bring corruption. But you can't do this and make it. Now, I want you to think, this principle, what I'm sharing with you right now, this principle is true in the world. God is saying, don't be deceived. If you hang around these kind of people, it's going to have an impact on you more than you having an impact on them. And even Jesus was tempted. You say, wait a minute, Brother Martin. Hold on. No, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say that Jesus was tempted like as we are, you know, in all ways, and, you know, but yet he stood strong and didn't sin? Okay, but he didn't go to the, you know, the bars. Do you understand what I mean by that? I mean, they had places like that back in those days. But when he ministered, people would show up and he'd minister to them. I mean, for crying out loud, he went to the temple. And there's a bunch of heathens dressed like priests at times. Heathens dressed like Pharisees. But yet Jesus stood strong and he didn't compromise. He set the example for us as far as what could be done. He's, he even, even Scripture even bears out that some of his family thought he was a nut. They thought that you know, he was beside himself. Because he took a stand for God. And what th the life of God in him. <clears throat> but this is borne out even in the world. See, people who are um, people who are really wealthy, I mean really wealthy, 
they hang around people who are really wealthy. You know, you're, you know, <laughs> you're not going to find Warren Buffett, who is one, one of the greatest, in, has one of the greatest investment minds in the world. The guy is a billionaire. He looks, <clears throat> he looks for businesses to buy. I heard he's looking for um, an airline to buy. You know, it's like, well, let me see. Is Delta for sale? <laughs> you know, when you've, got <clears throat> when you've got that kind of money, you're rich. And the one thing you're not going to do is find Warren Buffett palling around with somebody who doesn't even know how to balance a checkbook and who's worried about where they're going to buy their next hamburger. He's not going to sit with somebody like that and bounce ideas off of them for investments. You know, he's not going to do it. That, that just doesn't work. So Warren Buffett, he's going to hang around to people <clears throat> of like billions. You know, I remember hearing a story one time about a lady. She didn't just not balance her checking account. She'd open a checking account and leave it open for a period of time and then go open another one because she said that's easier than trying to balance my checkbook each month. I mean, seriously. And so she'd close the other one, get her money out, <laughs> and then go open another checking account. I'm not making that up. Okay, you got people out there who... who Warren Buffett's not going to talk to them. Neither, Bill Gates is not going to sit down and talk computer software with somebody who doesn't know how to work a calculator. It's not going to work. You take <laughs> a guy like Einstein. Okay, I know he's dead, but he's a good example. We, we all have heard of Einstein, how brilliant he was, a physicist and all this other. He's not going to sit down and try to glean from somebody who barely made it through sixth grade science class. That's not going to happen. You know, he'll be outside with somebody like that, and <clears throat> they're going to look up and say, Whoa, Albert, look, man, it's a full moon, dude. And look how bright it is. Wow, man, it's like you can almost reach out and touch it, dude. Now, while, while that guy is talking that way, Einstein's looking at that, and he's thinking, hmm, I wonder if the speed of the photons coming from the sun and bouncing off the surface of the moon to the earth is impacted by the distance of the moon from the sun when the light is reflected. Now, he's trying to figure this out, okay? Okay. And the other guy doesn't even know what a photon is. He thinks it's some kind of cracker that you eat with your soup. <laughs> yeah, dude, the photons, man. I'm hungry. Let's go get some. <laughs> Einstein's not going to hang around with it. He'll be polite to them, but they have nothing. Yeah, nothing in common. I mean, that person, other than friendliness, really has nothing to offer. Okay, now, let, let's talk about one that we can relate to. We know what it's like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We understand concepts of what it means when you pray in tongues and what happens. Now, you sit down with four or five people who don't even believe in tongues. What kind of a conversation are you going to have? It, within seconds, <laughs> maybe 60 you're going to try to figure out a way to get up and leave that conversation without being rude. What if they don't believe in healing? What if, they don't, what if there's a lot that they just don't believe in? What if they think they still have a sin nature? And there you sit listening to this. You can't have a conversation with people like that because they don't understand. There's nothing there for edification. Take it even further. What if you're with Christians, they're born again, yeah, we're born again. They believe in speaking in tongues, but 
They don't think it matters if you go out drinking. They don't think it matters if, you know, you're not married, you're living together. They don't think it matters if uh, you repent or not, and on and on it goes. What kind of conversation can you have with them? You sure can't talk about holiness. You then are the Pharisee. People of high IQ, they want to communicate with people of high IQ because they learn from each other. And people without a high IQ, they just kind of sit there. And they, they have no idea what's being discussed. They, they know that the words are in English, but they don't know what they mean. They cannot relate. Well, see, in the body of Christ, you have too many Christians who they don't hang around Christians who can edify them. Their circle of friends is not what it should be. But we get along. Okay. You know, there's probably a bunch of murderers in prison looking for somebody else to kill. They'll be nice to you. You'll get along with them, you know, until they decide to kill you. See, as Christians... If we do not watch out who we hang around with, those folks are going to have an influence on us, and that influence is going to hold us back in our walk with God. Now, this isn't about being rude and being unfriendly, but what it means is there are some people who are beneficial to your life, and there are some people who aren't. And as I'm delivering this message, what we need to do as believers, those here, those watching, those of you who are listening to this, you, know, you need to take a hard look at who are your friends? Who do you hang around with? And over um, <clears throat> my years of serving the Lord, I've encountered too many people, Christians now. They're hanging around with the wrong folks. And it shows. And the impact, it is evident in their life but they don't think it's a big deal they don't think it's a problem I remember when I was growing up there were there was a husband and wife a couple lived next door to us and I don't know they lived there maybe two or three years but anyway um, there was some sort of a, a company function for the man now the man and the wife they they didn't go to the same church we did but they professed to be Christians well you know, my mom and, and that lady, they, they got to be, you know, fairly good friends, talk a lot. Well, anyway, there was a, a company function for the husband, and they went to it. Well, you know, he's hanging around so many people that are of the world that he went to the bar. Now, he didn't order alcohol, but what he did was order a 7-Up, and they had, a, had an olive put in it so it would look like he had a drink. Follow me? So that he could blend in, so that he could be a part of what was going on. He wanted to be accepted by the wrong people. Now, I, I under, we all want to be liked. And there's a, there's a, a point to, of where we can get along with people, but there's a line drawn. And, and as a Christian, you can't cross that line. Now, <clears throat> Some people might think, well, okay, you, know, you got that verse right there in 1 Corinthians. I mean, I kind of see what you're saying, but I'm just not so sure that it really is that critical. All right, well, let's see if there's anything else in Scripture about this. Turn back over to Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11. See, Jesus gave a warning in Matthew 24. That when the false prophets arise, if it's possible, even the very elect are going to be deceived. That right there should tell you, I better watch out who I'm hanging around with. Because that's at a much higher level than just simply having friends. And here in, in uh, Proverbs 11, <clears throat> verse 14. Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Proverbs, oh, I'm sorry, Proverbs 10, 14. I apologize. Proverbs 10, 14. In Proverbs 10, 14, look at that. Read it again. 
Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Now see, you read that and you think, okay, well, great. But God's telling you, when you hang around wise people, wise, what do you mean wise people? People that are wise in the word, wise in the Lord. He's saying those people are going to lay up knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge of the Lord, knowledge of the word. And he says, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. That means when they open their mouth, they're going to speak destructive things into your life. There are some Christians, it's like they can't talk about anything concerning the word. They don't, they, it's like they can't have a conversation about the word, about Jesus. It, it, they're always wanting to talk about other stuff. Okay, I get it. You know, you have a conversation about the, the ball game. I get that. And, you know, well, what are you doing for the holidays? And I mean, there are all these casual conversations. I get it. But some Christians, it's like they can't talk about the Lord. It's weird. It's like that's not a part of their vocabulary. You just identified almost like the extreme example of fools. Then you've got people, Christians. Now, I'm talking about Christians who... They can talk Jesus, and they got Bible talk down. But when it's not Bible talk time, stuff that comes out of their mouth is destructive. There may even be, you know, foul four-letter words coming out. You don't need those kind of people in your circle. You work with them, you can't help it. There they are. Hey, good morning. How you doing? All right, you can't help that. But you don't need those people as your buddies. And then uh, now we'll go to chapter 11, verse 14. It says, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You need a multitude of godly counselors as your friends. Those are the people you need around you. And it might turn out the only ones you know outside of church, there might only be a couple out there. But I mean, you need that. See, this is one of the reasons why you need to foster relationships with people in the church who are pressing into God. And there are too many Christians that don't think they need that, and you're making a massive mistake. You're being influenced by the wrong folks. If you're not being influenced by godly people, you're being influenced by somebody. It's there. It's happening. Look over in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. See, I I need counsel. I'm not exempt from this. I can't hang out with just everybody who's serving as a pastor because there's a bunch of them out there. They cannot feed me. You know what I mean by that? And I'm just going to give you a heads up. The more you press into God and the more you follow this principle that I'm sharing with you right now, you're going to start, that circle of friends is going to start getting smaller and smaller. And if you're in ministry, say like me, pastoring, that circle of pastoral friends is going to get smaller and smaller. Because the deeper you go into God, the more you better want people who are going deeper into God. Oh, you'll be nice and loving, you know, to other folks and so forth and all that. I mean, you're not going to be rude and walk away from them. You're not going to shun them. But they're not going to be a part of your circle of friends. Now, look over in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. See, God's telling you right here, you need to walk with the wise. Even if all you do is sit and you don't engage in the conversation, soak it in. Soak it in. You need these kind of friends in your life. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 7. Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. You know, when the conversation isn't what it ought to be, Figure out a way to get up and leave. 
Figure out a way. And I know sometimes that can be difficult. I know it can be a challenge. Because, okay, I, well, I rode with this guy. So it's not like I'm going to get the keys to his car and leave him. But when you have the opportunity to make a difference for yourself, for your own benefit, do it. Do it. And don't lie. I mean, you don't have to be blunt and say, you have the mouth of a fool. I'm leaving. You don't have to be blunt. <laughs> Just excuse yourself, you know. <laughs> in Proverbs chapter 16, in verse 28, a froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. Okay, you don't need people like that. You, you have brother and sister in Christ, and they're known for wagging their tongue. <laughs> you don't need to be around them. You don't need it in your life. You don't need to hear it. You don't need to be a part of it. See, I've seen this happen. I've seen, you know, one person start, you know, yap, yap, yap. And then all of a sudden, other people are starting to join in. And I sit there and I watch this and I listen. It's like, okay. And I just sit and listen. And uh, I'm very grateful when I'm able to separate myself. Because I don't want to hear it. I don't want to be a part of it. See, guys, you, you keep taking a stand for Christ, and, and you do it in a polite way, but people are going to catch on. It may take a while, but people are going to figure this out. And the, I'm, not, I'm not at this point specifically identifying lost people. I'm talking about in the church. In Proverbs 22, look over there, Proverbs 22, verse 10. Cast out the scorner. And contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. You don't need to be around Christians that all they do is fuss and complain about somebody. Tell you what somebody did to them. Tell you, you know, how they treated you wrong. You don't need those kind of people as your friends. And, and if they're Christians, you know, and they start doing that, just, ask, just look them in the eye and say, When's the last time you prayed for them? And they're going to tell you something. Oh, I prayed for them last night. Then why are you still talking this way? I've actually encountered people where I've said things kind of like that. It kind of throws them off. They're not really sure how to respond. That's because they're not praying for the people the way they told me they were. And yeah, you're going to have people that are going to separate themselves from you because, well, they're going to call you what they want to call you. But this is the word of God. In Proverbs uh, chapter 22, look at verse 24. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. There it is. God's saying don't hang around these people. There's some Christians, good heavens. <laughs> you better not sit in their seat. Next thing you know, buddy, they're, they're ready to punch you in the nose. There's some Christians, they just... Look, we all, we've all gotten mad over the years, okay? And we've all, you know, lost our temper, as they say. But there are some Christians, this is like how they are. You don't need to be, you don't need those people to be in your circle of friends. And God is saying, he says, make no friendship with these kind of people. He's saying, don't do it. Don't do it. Otherwise, they're going to have an influence on you, and they will be a snare to your soul. Now, God's warning you about this. And he's saying, don't do this. You know, I remember one time I was at a conference in Tulsa, and Tim Stemple said, let the Holy Spirit choose your friends. Let the Holy Spirit choose your friends. In other words, let me say it a little bit differently for impact. Nobody becomes your friend unless the Holy Spirit approves. Nobody. Nobody. Look in uh, Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27, verse 17. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. You need iron. You need, you know, what does that mean? Well, it's symbolic. Okay, say it like this. You need people who are established on the foundation of the word of God. It's one thing to be able to talk it, 
you know, they know they're trained like parrots. They know what to say. You need somebody like this. Iron to sharpen your irons. These are the people. You need somebody who's going to talk straight up to you. And another thing, if you can't handle straight up talk, you're the problem. I mean, I have people come to me over the years. Now, pastor, just tell me how it is. I mean, just be straight up with me. Just be straight up with me. And as I'm sitting, I can fear, I can feel from them. Be straight up with me, but if you are, it's going to be the worst day of your life. <laughs> Come on, pastor, don't hold back, don't hold back. And I'm sitting there thinking, you don't mean that. I know you don't mean that. You want me to be straight up and blunt? I know it's going to happen. You're going to get mad with me. The veins are going to start popping out on your head. We may have to do CPR on you. <laughs> But if you can't handle, listen, if you, if you can't handle it, don't ask the question. Pastor, is there anything I need to change in my life? Be honest with me. Tell me. The Lord's shown you. Well, as a matter of fact, since you asked, sit down. <laughs> here's, here's a pad of paper. Here's a pen. <laughs> Write it down. Let's go. No, pastor, I just want you to tell me the things, you know, I just want, you know, oh, you know what, I'm late for an appointment, pastor. I <laughs> <laughs> Look over in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5. In verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. You need people in your life who are going to edify you. And you're going to know very quickly if, those, if, the, if a person is going to be an edifier. It won't take long. When people, all they want to do is they want to talk about how bad this is, how bad that is, how this is wrong, how that is wrong. When you have people, now listen to this, when you have people, all they want to do is talk about the past and all the good things God did in the past. Okay, I appreciate a good testimony, all right? And I know God moves. But if that's all you talk about, okay, what's happening now? What's going on between you and God now in the Word? What's taking place in the now? And people, they want to talk about, you know, all their their sickness, their disease, you know, they, I mean, it's like there's no edification in this. And you know, you can sense on the inside of you when you're being edified. Some people, during our greeting time here at church, when people get around, hey, how you doing? You know, shake, shake, shake. Hey, good to see you. Shake, shake, shake. All right. In, in just that three to four, maybe five seconds of a hello, good to see you, you can sense an edification. Not from everybody, but from some people you can. That's what you need. Now, when I talk about friends, I'm not talking about you get together every night, you do, you know, okay. But you have this friendship. And here's the thing. When you're following this principle in the Word of God, God, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, will begin to cultivate the bond. Now, that, again, that doesn't mean that you're going to run to the mall every night. You're going to, you know, hey, come on over and let's have popcorn and watch the ball game. It, it doesn't mean it's going to be like that all the time, but there is going to be that something that's hard to put into words, but it's there. It is there. Look over in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You need verses 24 and 25 people in your life. These are the kind of people you need for friends. You need people who are going to provoke you unto love and to good works. You're going to need people what you don't need are people who attend church whenever they feel like it. 
those aren't true friends for you. Because they haven't matured to the point in God to where they understand there's a need for me to be there. I'm supposed to be there because God said so. So even if I don't understand the fullness of the why I need to be there, yeah, God said so. That's all the why I need. Now, I understand. You know, we've got people who attend this church, and they, they drive long distances. And I understand that, you know, some of these folks, they can't be here with every service. I get that. I understand. It's not that they wouldn't be here. It's just logistics make it really difficult. Hey, that's all right. That's not a problem. And I know that, you, you know, you might have somebody in your church to where um, maybe for whatever the reason, they have difficulty driving at night because of their vision. Hey, it's all right. We get that. We're going to be- keep just believing God for your manifested healing. But all those kind of things aside, Christians who just kind of take a, they they let all kinds of stuff influence them to stay away. And they don't really make the effort to be here, whether it's here, you know, you folks watch them wherever your church is. See, you need somebody that's not going to forsake the assembling of themselves together with us, the rest of us. You say, wow, now, pastor, that's easy for you to say. I mean, you're the pastor. <laughs> it's your job. You've got to be here. <laughs> I'd be here anyway. If I weren't the pastor, I'd be here because that's just how I am. That's the way I've been in my church attendance. Long before I ever preached my first sermon, I had to, every time the door, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you something I did is one of the dumbest things, that, well, to some people, it's one of the dumbest things I ever did in my life. On February 6th, Saturday, February 6th, 1982, Kathy and I got married. Sunday night, February 7th, we were back in church. Now, I know what you're thinking. That was stupid, Brother Martin. You just got married. You're supposed to be with your wife. You know, and you're right. I agree. (laughs) We didn't go out of town. We stayed at, we were there though. Okay? But you have to make that decision. It takes an effort to do this. And I know sometimes people, you know, physically not feeling well. Okay, but again, all those things, we're not talking about that. It's all about the people. That they've got all the excuses in the world. All right, you need friends who are going to provoke you unto love and to good works. What are good works? Living for Jesus. And that's really what this is talking about. Anybody can help a little old lady across the street. Anybody can, you know, go downtown and pass out, you know, sandwiches to hungry people. and all. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the good works of living for God, serving the Lord. And he says, you need people that are going to exhort you. Exhort you what? In your walk with God. You're going to speak God's life into you. Speak God's word into you. That's what you need. Those are the kind of folks you need to hang around. Even if you never in your life go to dinner with them. When you have the chance, though, you feed off them. You know, I don't mean you be a pest, but those are the people you want to be around. Those are the people you want as your friends. And if you, God, listen, God will help you develop a personality that will mesh with the people that you need as your friends. Now, that may sound a little weird, but you have the life and the nature and the character of God on the inside, and he, through that, will work on you and your personality so that you're not obnoxious, overbearing, uh, rude, or, I mean, whatever. We, he will mold you into the kind of person you need to be for these kind of friendships. And if you look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're not going to read this, this whole passage, we're just going to read one verse, verse 11. But now I have written to, unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. 
with such a one do not eat. These are Christians. You draw the line. Why? Because one thing it's going to do is going to mess up your testimony because you're hanging around people you shouldn't hang around with and they're going to have an influence on you, whether you like it or not. They're going to have an influence on you. Now, you're going to have some people that fit into some of these categories that God warns us against. They show up for church. Well, you know, you're not going to stand at the front door of the church and take inventory on their life. But they're going to show up. But even if they do, he says, don't you eat with them. So you don't invite them to lunch. And if they invite you, you can be blunt and say, I know that you are, you know, a fornicator. I know that you are an adulterer. I know that you are a um, drunker. I know you go out and you party and you get drunk. I know. And because of the word of God right here, I'm sorry, I can't go out with you. Well, they might get all mad, but God's going to reach down and pat you on the back. And he will be your comfort. I look over in James, James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, verse 4, the adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship, the friendship of the world, is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And you can have friendship with the world with other Christians. Because if they're living like the world, and they're, they're moving closer and closer to that permanent searing of the conscience, and you have that fellowshipping lifestyle with them, okay, you know what? God's saying, not only are they on thin ice, but your ice is getting thin. Because they're having an influence. See, even if you don't feel like they're having an influence on you because you have a fellowshipping friendship lifestyle with people God says, don't do that. He doesn't say you can't shake their hand or say hi to them. But he's saying you, they're not supposed to be a part, an integral part of your life. And if they are, then at first, you, you don't feel anything. You don't think they're influencing you. You don't think they're having an, an impact. But eventually, yeah, according to the word of God, they will have an impact. You know, you might work a job to where you're the only Christian surrounded by a thousand lost professional heathens. All right? God's not saying quit your job. No. You've got to be strong in the Lord and the power of his mind. See, you can make it because that's your job. That's not creating a circle of friends. That's not bringing the world into your life. That's not bringing lukewarmness and carnality into your life. You may live at home. You know, you're married to lukewarm. You know, you're married to carnal. You're married to backslider. You know, man or woman, either one. You're married to that. Well, you, you got a situation, and Paul addresses some of that over there in Corinthians. But when it comes to establishing your friendships with people, there are a lot of other verses besides what we looked at here tonight, guys. God is saying, you better guard your heart. You better guard your life. You better protect yourself. And like I shared earlier, let the Holy Spirit choose your friends. He'll let you know who to hang around with. He'll let you know who. See, what I did at the beginning of the service, I said, I'm going to share with you one of the things that, that's causing so many Christians to not make progress in the Lord. It's because of who they hang around with. It's who their friends are. It's, it's who they, they have that fellowship with. Who they're constantly, you know, like Paul said, you know, don't eat with them. Well, they're violating the word of God and they're eating with them. And God, see, God not, he's not saying this to be, to teach us how to be rude to people. He's saying this because he knows how critical this is. He knows how important this is. And we don't see it the way he does. But in the Old Testament, here in the New Testament, he gives the warning. He says, you don't get it. This is more serious than what you realize. And you've got to watch yourself. You've got to guard yourself. I'll help you establish friendships. 
I'll work with you as far as how you are and your personality, but you've got to step into the, the fellowship with me and my word to understand these things and accept it and, and let your life become a reflection of these standards that I present to you in my word. And I'll just tell you right now, for some Christians, this is going to be very hard because they've allowed themselves to be pulled in. And maybe they don't think it's that big of a deal. Maybe they don't care, whatever. But it matters to God. And see, if you've got the wrong people in your circle of friends, this is a setup for deception. The Matthew 24 deception. I don't, I know over, over my life, there have been people that, um, you know, I don't stay away from family reunions just because there might be a few heathens show up. But there have also been people that in my life over the years where we have gone from being friends to acquaintances. And so we still, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. How things going? Talk, talk, talk. But as far as the friendship that used to be there, it's not like it was. Oh, we didn't have an argument or a falling out. It wasn't anything like that. It's just... When you're pressing into God and you're letting God and these principles become a standard in your life, it begins to happen. And it's like it just happens. Well, you know, praise God. That is God watching out for us and helping us as our loving Father. You know, think about it in the natural. As parents, did we not warn our kids? You don't need to be hanging around that crowd. Well, <laughs> our Father God is saying, you don't need to be hanging around that crowd. <laughs> let the holy spirit choose our friends and they'll they'll definitely be the friends that we need glory to god please stand father i thank you for this and i know that for some people this is a real difficult thing but yet it's your word and it's true so I pray for those of us here and those watching, those listening, that we will understand, fully understand what it is you're saying to us about this matter and not swing out one direction or the other, you know, so radically that we get off center. And help us, Father, if we have friends that, that don't need to be that close inner circle of friendship with us, then, Father... I would say help us understand to cast it over onto you and let you work it out and help us to work it out so that we have the right friendships that we need. And Father, I thank you for this because we all need that iron sharpening our iron. And Jesus, I thank you for being the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Praise the Lord. So Father, as we leave here tonight, I want to thank you for again being with us. Thank you for your word. And as we go home, just watch over us, protect us and our vehicles. And prepare our hearts and minds, Father, for this coming Sunday and what you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Those of you, if you have an offering, please go ahead and bring it up before you leave. Have a blessed remainder of this evening, and we'll see you again.